We're talking about network security with Jan Francisco. And uh, the two presenters we have today, uh, Aaron, principal engineer from Cisco Systems, and Matt from, uh, Matt, sorry, Matt, uh, senior network engineer with Liberty Mutual. And with that, guys, take it away. Okay, is this on yet? There we go. Okay, so, um, yeah, as he said, um, Aaron Wolin, I'm a principal engineer in advanced threat at Cisco. Um, one of the original people on a little product called Identity Services Engine, and uh, now I focus on advanced malware protection, the Cisco Security Connector, and the things that I'm going to talk about at the end. Um, Matt, I'll let him introduce himself also, but you want to go ahead now? Yep, I'm Matt Vanderhorst. I'm a senior network engineer for Liberty Mutual, and uh, within Liberty, I manage our instance of Identity Services Engine. So uh, Matt and I met a while back because uh, he came up to me after a session at Cisco Live and he started talking about um, limitations with Identity Services Engine and things that he did through the API. Um, and, and literally the presentation he's gonna give you, maybe, I don't even think it's sanitized. It's the same presentation I had him give to our engineering uh, leads inside of Cisco for the Identity Services Engine saying, this is what a customer has done to overcome some of our limitations. And, uh, and I think that's gonna be the most valuable part of this whole session, so um, looking forward to that uh, again. So uh, what we're gonna cover today is, um, I'm gonna give you a, a very brief overview of the Cisco Identity Services Engine. This is not gonna be a product pitch. Um, and then I'm gonna go to the more interesting part, let Matt come up, talk about um, what they've done with ICE, what they've done with Jamf, and ways that he's gone about using the APIs to create some really custom integrations and really, really cool things, uh, and, and how that can help overcome it. And then I'm gonna talk a little bit about the Cisco Security Connector, which is a uh, Cisco-Apple joint uh, security solution that we put together um, and is gonna be available with Jamf hopefully very soon. All right, um, I'm, I'm, I'm getting nods. So, I mean, I'm, we're watching the user stories getting nailed down one by one and it's, it's getting there. So that's great. All right, so to start off with, um, how many of you have heard about Cisco's Identity Services Engine or ICE? All right, oh, sweet. Okay, so this, you don't need me to talk at all then. I can let just keep going. Um, but for those of you that don't know what it is, right, the Identity Services Engine is what I like to refer to as next generation NAC. Right? Um, it, it was an evolution of network access control or secure network access, right? taking products and, and technologies like 802.1x, right? guest access, profiling, which is just as bad as it sounds, like racial profiling, but on devices, okay? And posture assessment, right? So the posture assessment is identifying the compliance of the device. Is it running jamp? Right? Is, it, is it there, is it running? Does Jamf say that the device matches the policies that are built inside of Jamf? That type of thing, all right? Um, and, and, and defining all of this, so the who, the what, the where, the when, the why, the how, even now the threat levels, the vulnerability levels seen on the endpoint, all being used as part of an access control decision, right? As to if you gain access to the network, and if you gain access to the network, what level of access do I give you? And if any of that changes, right, and all of a sudden there's new vulnerabilities or new threats or something identified on that, right, changing that level of access that you have to the network, right? That is what ICE does. And that's ultimately what this is, right? Managing that policy based on a level of trust. How much do I trust this endpoint, this user, and how much access should they get, right? Um, you know, that is the purpose of the Identity Services Engine, right? So this is kind of the use cases of ICE. I kind of threw them up here in one slide, right? The idea is to give you visibility. So in many of our cases, the folks in, in this conference, right, you have access to tools like Jamf, right, that are gonna give you a contextual awareness of the endpoints in your environment. The network team doesn't always have that same set of, of access. How many of you in this room run uh, Jamf Pro? Uh, you're the admin for it. How many of you give access to that to your network team? Two guys, all right, so audit. yeah. What's that? They get audit. They get audit mode, there you go, right? So that, that's usually what, what will happen, right? It's like, you stay out of my toys and I'll stay out of your toys, right? 
So one of the things that ICE does is it brings this level of visibility to the security team that's operating ICE or to the network team that's operating ICE. Right? And then using that level of visibility that you can have about those endpoints and information that's in other tools to define what access you get to the network. Um, one of the other wonderful terms, because we're Cisco and our marketing is fantastic, right? software-defined segmentation. Um, this is a really long name for saying I'm, I'm creating segmentation within a network without having to define separate VLANs. Right? So I'm not, not separating you inside the separate VLANs and giving you separate IP addressing and doing a lot of that very, very complex and orthogonal things that you have to do. Right? Instead, I am, just, I am able to provide that segmentation in a flat environment. Right? And, and we do that with, um, if I went back a slide, we do that in a way that's it's really kind of slick. It actually looks like a spreadsheet. We start to say these resources are allowed to talk to these resources, or these resources can talk to these resources, but only on these ports. And it's layer three agnostic, so IPv4, IPv6 doesn't matter. That's one of the other things that ICE actually enables for us. Um, guest access, rapid threat containment is the term we talk about for taking that action, that quarantine or other level of action. Quarantine is a misnomer. This, I've, I've just, I just presented on this last week in San Jose, and I got, I got equated to um, uh, Chris Farley doing the uh, man down, you know, in a van down by the river guy. So I will not shout this this time. I'll just say that quarantine itself doesn't mean anything. It's up to you to define, right? So if, if, an act, if something bad happens and I take an action, I can do anything I want to in that action. I can actually launch malware at you if I wanted to. I can do whatever I want to. It's defined by software. As creative as you want to get, you can do it, right? So it doesn't mean kick off the network, right? A perfect example of this is I could say, hey, a new vulnerability was discovered or a threat. I'm going to change your access, start decrypting your SSL as you exit my gateway, send that off to be analyzed. Um, I'm going to limit your access to PII. You're not going to be able to talk to my PCI servers, right? And I'm going to do all that by assigning a tag at layer two. It's really simple. Now let's talk about it with Jamf, right? So we actually have a representative of Cisco IT in the audience, which is cool. We are huge Jamf users. Um, we still call it Casper, like probably everybody else, but right, we are huge Jamf users. And I mean, we have, I think 30,000, maybe 40,000 Macs now at Cisco. I'm getting a nod, so I'm, the number must be right. It's higher than that. 46,000 Macs at Cisco, right? So out of a 70,000 person company, I think that's pretty good. Um, so, you know, Jamf, can, you know, what was one of the first things Cisco IT asked for when we started rolling out ICE internally, right, was I need my connectivity with Jamf, I want to use that as uh, one of the attribute sources, right, um, one of the, the pieces of information to define access, I want to use Jamf. What does Jamf say about that endpoint? Are they running it? Is it compliant? And so forth, right? And that's ultimately what we can do. You can start to gain access to the network. The request gets sent over to ICE to determine whether you're allowed to access that network, wired or wireless, right? ICE checks with Jamf. It says, is this a managed endpoint? If it is managed, what is its posture level? What is its compliance level? And based on that, it can then determine whether or not you gain access, such like this slide, right? What if, what if Jamf says that the device is jailbroken? Right, so Jamf says that iOS device, it's jailbroken. Jailbroken means no, non-compliant. You don't get access. You don't pass go, you don't, get, you don't collect $200. Or maybe you get limited access. Maybe I'm gonna drop you into an isolation environment where I can still reach the device, fix it, and then give you full access without ever having to physically touch it. Right, these are, these are all different options, but it's kind of how it works. Now. If I were to sit here and tell you that the integration is perfect, I'd be a complete and utter liar. And I would disagree. And, and he would disagree with that perfect statement anyway, right? So it is nowhere near perfect. So what Matt's gonna talk to you about is the realities of it and, and the ability to use APIs between ICE and his own tools and so forth to overcome some of those limitations. And now it's all you, man. Thank you. I'll stand back. So now that you have an overview of what ICE itself is, we can talk about how we at Liberty Mutual took the ICE platform 
and the Jamf platform and combine them. So we predictably have a Cisco wired and wireless network, um, Identity Services Engine version two, Jamf Pro 9, which I've learned this week is probably a given, um, and 950-ish managed macOS devices. We're adding about 40 a month, so the environment's actually growing pretty quickly. Um, so the native integration that Aaron mentioned, it, it definitely works. So out of the box, ICE and Jamf can talk to each other. Um, and it allows you to do things like uh, use MDM functions within ICE. So you can actually look at a session with an identity services engine and um, you know, kick it off the network, take network actions obviously, but you can also do things like wipe the device from ICE using that integration with Jamf. Um, so it, ex it, al it allows that extended functionality and it also allows ICE to query Jamf for device information like Aaron mentioned, so when you write your uh, authorization policies, you can make more informed decisions. So we don't use it, but I wanted to include a little bit of information on how the native integration works, just so you guys get an idea. So on the Jamf side, it's pretty simple. You just create a network integration and you select ICE as the service type. So really all you're doing is telling Jamf, I want you to talk to Identity Services Engine. Um, you define a, an advanced computer search for what you consider to be a compliant device. So um, if a device isn't in that kind of compliant search result, uh, ICE won't allow it on. And after you save it, Jamf at the bottom will give you a network integration uh, endpoint URL. So then when you go into Identity Services Engine, uh, you basically just kind of have to fill that in. Right, and say, I want you to talk to Jamf as a mobile device manager. Uh, here's the integration URL, the domain name of the JSS, and then a service account that has access to the JSS. Setup is really that simple. Uh, and so then when you look at what the actual policies in ICE look like, so this is a sample of an authorization uh, policy. And what you'll notice, and this is important to kind of the next slide, is that two mobile device managers are listed here, right? So you see Mobile Iron as well as Jamf. And so what you can do is in your policies, you can then use these different attributes provided by the mobile device manager to make better decisions. So is it jailbroken or not? Is the pin enabled? Is it encrypted and so on? If it is, you can allow it on the network. If it's not, you can do things like redirect it to a splash page that says you're not compliant, redirect the device to Jamf or Mobile Iron or whatever uh, for remediation and if all else fails, don't let the device on the network. So the native integration works, but for us in an environment our size, what didn't work out of the box? Well, so in Identity Services Engine, having multiple mobile device managers is tricky. Um, it's actually only relatively recently supported, and even though it is supported, uh, you'll see in the next slide that it's kind of complicated. We also ran into issues, uh, we have a lot of devices with more than two MAC addresses. So when you look at dongles and docks and adapters and Thunderbolt displays and different things, we find that our devices just somehow magically accumulate millions of MAC addresses. And then we have multiple types of managed devices. So we don't treat all MACs equally within Liberty and the native integration doesn't really give you a way to distinguish between them. So having multiple mobile device managers, um, we were already using mobile iron and after ICE 1.4, multiple MDMs are supported but the problem is you have to be able to tell between your different types of devices, right? So you have to be able to say, I want iPhones and iPads to go to one or MacBooks to go to another. ICE is a profiling engine, right? So part of the intent of ICE is it can figure out what your devices are, but what we found is a lot of Apple devices look the same uh, and it can't always tell specifically enough what they are to figure out which mobile device manager to send it to. Um, Limitation number two, so devices with more than two MAC addresses. So Jamf keeps track of a primary and alternate MAC address, and after those first two, it doesn't really keep track of anything. And so when we had all these dongles and docks and different ways people are connecting to the network with shared workspaces and things like that, we found that a lot of devices were getting rejected simply because they were connecting from the third or fourth or fifth MAC address. And since Jamf doesn't know what those MAC addresses are, when ICE reaches out to Jamf and says, who is this MAC address? It basically says, I don't know. And then finally, the multiple types of managed devices. So at Liberty, um, our largest population of Macs is developers. 
Um, but we also have people in graphic design and marketing and other parts of the business, and we treat those populations of people differently. We have different uh, networks for developers as opposed to kind of regular employees, and the native integration doesn't really give you a way to tell between those types of devices. So Jamf, you can use extension attributes and groups and things to segment those devices, but none of that information actually carries over to ICE. So our solution is kind of a combination of things on both sides, on both platforms. Um, it really comes down to some extension attributes in Jamf um, so that we can categorize the devices. Uh, we use advanced computer search to pull lists of devices that ultimately get synchronized to ICE. And then we use identity groups in Identity Services Engine to tell them apart. And then we use APIs and automation to kind of pull all those pieces together. So this is what we started with before Jamf came in the picture. So we have a tool internally, uh, we call it NAT, and that tool basically kind of keeps in sync with Identity Services Engine. So every hour it goes and it downloads a list of uh, all of the devices that are in static assignments in ICE, and then the tool also allows us to push changes back to ICE. Um, so we already had this kind of internal uh, tool. So when Jamf came in, we said, all right, now we need to figure out how are we gonna get all this information about these Macs into Identity Services Engine not using the native integration. So the first thing we did is we said, okay, we're gonna pull that advanced computer search, uh, get that list of devices, Mac addresses, and so on. We're gonna push it into that NAT tool that sits in the middle, and then we're gonna let it push those changes into Identity Services Engine. So that process together is what we call internally Jamf Sync. So it allows us to keep the device information moving from Jamf over to ICE. Now, the problem with that is it runs every hour, right? So how frequently do devices change? How frequently do people enroll in our developer program? How frequently do they fall out of compliance or something like that? And we found that every hour was just simply not sufficient, um, especially when someone enrolls a device and it takes up to 45 minutes for that device to actually start working correctly. So that's when we added webhooks into it. So we originally used the Java Events API, but we found that that was a little harder to maintain, and we just recently moved over to webhooks. So now we kind of have that real-time communication where the JSS can tell us, hey, a computer was enrolled, and then the tool sitting in the middle says, okay, I'll push those changes to Identity Services Engine. So this is all obviously using the Jamf APIs, the webhooks, and then obviously the APIs available in Identity Services Engine. So now we can look at kind of a practical example of when you take this whole thing and put it together, right? What does it actually look like? So first you say, okay, a user is gonna connect their device to the network. There we go. Right? And then the network is gonna ask Identity Services Engine, well, should I let it on or not? What should I do with this? And Identity Services Engine, if it's a new device it doesn't know about, is gonna say, yeah, put that in quarantine, right? Maybe it's a new device out of the box. Jamf doesn't know who it is. ICE doesn't know who it is yet. But in quarantine, we say, okay, well, you're in quarantine, but we're gonna let you talk to Jamf, right? So you can go do your user-initiated enrollment, and we allow that traffic through. And as soon as that enrollment happens, we have the ability to use that webhook to tell our tool, okay, this device was just enrolled, right? We have a new device that was added, and then we can push that change up to Identity Services Engine. So now we kind of completed that whole cycle. Identity Services Engine sits there and says, hey, something about this device changed, right? I got an API request to change it to a different group or whatever, and so ICE is gonna tell the network something changed here, and the network's gonna say, okay, this device is good to go now, right? So from the user perspective, this is what it looks like. And then obviously if we add the back end into it, this is kind of what the whole solution looks like. So now kind of with an overview of that, how does it actually work and what's actually behind it, right? So the first thing we did with Jamf's help is we created an extension attribute that contains every MAC address that a device has. So this is the attribute definition in the JSS, and this is the script. So this script runs on the device and it collects basically every MAC address for certain types of adapters that you see there and puts them into a pipe delimited uh, attribute that we can then use later. We also created a developer computer attribute. So those are the population of people that we treat most differently. And so by default, it's nothing, but when somebody uses self-service and enrolls in our developer program, we set the attribute to true. Uh, right. And then we pull those two things together with an advanced computer search. 
Um, so we created a custom advanced computer search. And what you'll notice is the criteria of the search is what determines what we consider to be compliant. So anything in this search result is what is going to get pulled and ultimately pushed over to Identity Services Engine. So for us, um, it's devices that are managed and that have checked in within 90 days. And this is what the result looks like, heavily adapted per corporate security. Uh, but you can see uh, the beginning of the list of MAC addresses. Um, and then to the far right, there's that developer computer attribute. So we can use that information uh, once it comes out of the API. So this is a sample of the uh, API requests that we use to pull that advanced computer search. Very, very simple. Just basically say to the JSS, give me this advanced computer search. The ID is 18. And you put your authorization header in there. That's a pretty straightforward API call. This is a sample of what the results look like. So this is um, one uh, result that was taken out for a single device, just so you can get an idea. It's all JSON, so it's really easy to work with. But you can see our all MAC address attribute and then our developer computer attribute. So on the ICE side, the configuration is really simple. It's a group for each type of device that you want to have, right? So we have a group uh, for kind of developers, and then we have a group for everything else we consider compliant. So it's really basically developers versus internal users. So then the JamSync that I mentioned earlier takes the results of the advanced computer search and kind of pushes those changes, right? So in JAMF, we have our list of managed, enrolled, you know, happily checked in devices. Um, and then we pull that advanced computer search out using the API. And then we have the ability to determine, all right, there's some new devices here. There's some devices that have been unenrolled or they're no longer compliant. And we also have some devices that may have changed from a marketing person to a developer. So this script just kind of runs every hour and, and does this kind of true up of the list of devices. So I can't share the code for that itself, unfortunately, but this is what the output at least looks like. So it basically takes those lists of devices, compares them, figures out the changes it needs to make, and then it pushes those changes to ICE using its API. So the other thing about it is we built this into a tool that we already had. So if you actually get to this point, you decide to do something similar, um, the biggest benefit for us was audit, right? So we have a lot of requirements around what devices have access to the network at any given time. And if someone gets their access added or removed, we usually need to be able to account for that. So every time this tool makes a change, whether it's a new device coming from Jam for a device being unenrolled, whatever the change is, um, there's an audit record, right? So then later we can look and say, okay, this device in, looks like June or May, right, was in, uh, enrolled as a regular compliant Mac, but then a month later, this person enrolled in our developer program, and you can see that they switched between groups. So doing some of this custom integration also allows you to build in some auditing and other functions that you might find helpful as well. So now these are just some examples of uh, API calls to ICE. So the, the Jamf API is really, really well documented, really easy to work with, and it's all JSON. The ICE API is a little more difficult to work with, and depending on version of ICE, um, is generally only XML, but the newer versions do support JSON as well, apparently. It's a lot harder to work with. It's a lot harder to work with. It's, it's appalling, in fact. Um, <laughs> so this is an example of uh, a, an API command to ICE to update an endpoint. So you do a put. Right, you've got the unique identifier of that uh, endpoint in ICE, the group that we want to move it into, and then um, the MAC address. And you'll notice it says static group assignment is true. So we're basically telling ICE, put this MAC address in this group and leave it there. Don't move it in or out based on profiling or other things. It's a static assignment. We know this device is good to go. If the device doesn't exist yet, this is an example of a, a post. So in ICE, you do puts to update, posts to create. Um, so this is more or less the same thing, um, creating a record for that MAC address with a static group assignment in the group that you see there. You'll notice the only difference really is that that unique identifier is not there because it doesn't exist yet. Uh, you can also do a MAC address search in the ICE API. So when you start looking at custom integration and actually working with Identity Services Engine, this is, at least in my opinion, one of the kind of most useful API calls I've ever used. Uh, and it basically lets you go to ICE and say, do you know about this MAC address? 
and you can set the page size to however many you want, but in this instance, right, page one, size one. We really, really want one result. And when you send that command, you get an XML formatted response with all of the device's information. Uh, well, actually, I should say you get the unique identifier, right? So you get the unique identifier, and then you can make another call, and this is one of my biggest gripes with their API. It takes two API calls to get a full endpoint, um, but you do a get on that unique identifier, and then you get all the device information, right? So you can see what group it's in, the MAC address, which you should already know. If it's a static group assignment, static profiling assignment. And you can also see the profiling policy. In this example, this device isn't profiled. So JamSync is good at keeping everything in sync every hour, right? But every hour is not quick enough. There's delays. Um, if a device enrolls while that in synchronization is running, it could take up to the next script execution to run. And so we said, all right, how do we do this faster? How do we do this in real time? And the answer was webhooks. Um, so the computer added webhook is basically what we use. So when a computer gets registered in Jamf and this trigger runs, um, we can, in real time, push that change over to Identity Services Engine to make sure that that device gets pretty much instant access to the network. This is what the webhook looks like. So, um, Jamf basically is kind of pushing out a request to my tool, and this is the data that it gives to my tool. So I can take those first two MAC addresses, and again, it's worth noting, right, these are the first two. So this doesn't have our all MAC address attribute yet. We don't have our pipe delimited list. Um, so we're kind of relying on Jamf and hoping that the first two MAC addresses that it captured are the ones that the user is using. We'll kind of figure out the rest of the MAC addresses later when that JamSync runs and trues everything up. So the other thing is, well, we have to deal with when these device types change, right? So when someone enrolls as a developer, do we want them to have to wait an hour to then use our developer wireless or our other developer networks? We don't really want them to have to wait that long. Um, so with the smart group membership change event, we can actually get a notification when devices move between groups. So this is a sample of what that looks like. So our tool gets a notification that says, hey, something about this is a developer computer group has changed. And so that allows us to then kind of revalidate that all the devices are where they belong and make any changes that we need to. Now, unfortunately, the one complaint I have with this webhook is it doesn't actually tell you which computer changed. It just tells you that the group has had a change. So unfortunately, you end up having to kind of resynchronize everything um, just for the sake of one device. So to recap, right, we have the backend processes managing the synchronization. Um, we have kind of JamSync keeping us honest, making sure that things are always in alignment. And we have the webhooks doing that kind of real-time notification of change over to ICE. The other thing is Jamf doesn't have an event for if a computer is unenrolled. Right? There's a mobile device unenrolled webhook, but there isn't a computer unenrolled. So JamSync is necessary to make sure that when a device falls out of compliance or gets unenrolled, that it actually gets removed from having network access. And then on the front end, right, you can see that user process where we're still using that kind of real-time integration with the webhooks and putting someone in quarantine, giving them the access they need to at least enroll and start provisioning, and then taking those restrictions off of them so that they can use the network fully. So in full disclosure, right, this solution has some caveats. So when you enroll a device, um, everything starts as the same type of device. Right? So everything initially is treated as just kind of a regular compliant corporate device. We don't have the ability for someone to enroll immediately as a developer. So they kind of have two steps there. Um, the other thing is, when you're not using the native integration, you lose access to those uh, MDM functions, right? So from within ICE, uh, we lose the ability to remotely wipe or remotely set a pin lock and things like that. Now, in our environment, I'm a network engineer. I don't want access to that anyways and I don't want my team to have access to that anyways. So it kind of works out pretty well for us. Um, also cheaper. It's what? Yeah, you don't require the Apex license. That's true. Yeah. Aaron says it's cheaper. The licensing is cheaper. <laughs> um, and then shared network adapters are challenging, right? So I mentioned those dongles, docks, Thunderbolt displays, things like that. Those get really challenging, right? If people are sharing MAC addresses, do you risk you know, doing a static assignment and saying, hey, this MAC address is a developer Right? But it's a dongle sitting on a desk in a shared workspace, and a graphic designer comes and plugs that dongle in, and now they're somehow a developer. Right? So these MAC addresses get, get tricky sometimes. 
And ultimately, you need something to facilitate that communication between platforms, right? So we already had this existing um, network access control kind of management tool that I wrote, um, but you don't really need it. So if you're using something like webhooks, you can kind of do everything in an all-in-one transaction, right? Get the webhook from Jamf, go to ICE, get what you need, reconcile it, and the transaction's over. You don't necessarily need to have some big tool sitting in the middle. And then one of the more important things, remember that you still want identity. Right? So we're not just simply allowing these MAC addresses free reign on the network just because they're in these groups. We're still doing 802.1x. Right? So you can still be doing your user or machine authentication. You can still be doing your certificates or whatever it is that you want to use for authentication. And with that, back to Aaron. Sweet. Thanks. You are so welcome. Appreciate it. How much time do I got? got oh, 15. Oh, that was that's good. A little extra time. OK. So we're going to talk about something brand new. It's uh, a lot of fun. There's a couple guys in the room I see from Apple that know about this, but not too many people know about it yet. Um, so, oh, this is the bad slide. I'm not supposed to have privacy on here per Apple. Um, <clears throat> so uh, nobody tell Apple that I did that. <clears throat> no. So, uh, so um, uh, ultimately how this came about. So a couple years ago, um, still when John Chambers was our CEO, um, he and Tim Cook sat down and they said, we want to we wanna work together to start providing uh, better solutions um, for you know, Mac, or not Mac, but Apple and Cisco for the enterprise, right? Um, which was a, a huge step forward because everyone knows Jobs was pretty much, no, we're a consumer device, we're not for the enterprise. So that was pretty interesting. So um, really great idea, really bad naming. We called them Waves. So for any of us involved in wireless, when people are talking about, oh, we're doing wave two, and I'm thinking, oh, okay, what does that have to do with wave two and wireless? No, 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 it was phase two of the Apple-Cisco partnership, right? Um, and, it, and the first one came out, and it was all about like fast lane and, and things, things to make networking experience better with Apple devices. And there's some pretty cool hooks there. Second phase, though, what we really focused on was more things around collaboration and more things around networking, but also now we've got security in here. So when you work with Apple and you start saying, all right, we want to address security, there's, um, there's a whole lot of things that come to light. Well, first of all, you get a company who is extremely concerned with user experience, which was just for me, really, really, really fun and like just eye-opening and refreshing, right? I mean, not that many people think of Cisco and say, hey, there's a good user experience. Um, so th this was really kind of cool, right? So uh, the other thing is they're extremely concerned about security, right? Which was also really refreshing. Um, so, you know, it, it can sometimes be a bit of a pain on the development side, but on the what are we producing side? It's fantastic to work with a company that is that concerned about security. Now, the reasons may be selfish, right? I mean, they've got the most valuable brand in the world and they don't want it tarnished, right? But it's still like, <laughs> there's another mobile operating system vendor that I've sent vulnerabilities to and they just didn't care. So this was just really, really, really refreshing to work with someone who really cared right up front. They wanted to change how a lot of this works with the mobile experience that you have today to keep that mobile experience really good. And, and the result, and this is just the first security thing we've come out with together is the Cisco Security Connector. Now, where did it get its name? Apple flat out said, you cannot call it advanced malware anything because there's no malware on iOS. I was like, okay, well, we can't call it AMP. All right. Then the other thing they said was, and whatever you do, do not call it any connect. So it's, it, and, uh, and Apple actually designed the, the, uh, the icon for it as well, which was cool. So Apple's like, come on into our user experience center. And, and someone said no, and I about slapped them. I was like, you know, uh, uh, you know, the company that has, is like world renowned for the best user experience ever wants to open up their kimono and let you see how they do things. And you said no? I was like, okay, he needs to be fired. Move on, next guy. But, um, you know, so, what, it, what we came up with was a way to do visibility that's never been there before, right? So visibility from an iOS device, whether you're on network, off network, right? So if I'm on LTE, if I'm multi-path TCP, doesn't matter. 
right? It, it's not relying on the Cisco network to provide this visibility. It's coming from iOS, so native hooks to provide visibility where we've always been blind from a security operator perspective, right? Always blind. Providing levels of control against phishing, against going to bad places either on purpose or accidentally without having to reach around the back of your head to scratch your nose, right? All just native, simple flows, no changes to an end user experience. The privacy aspect of it, they don't like that because we're, we're providing visibility where visibility wasn't there before. So Apple said, so how can you claim privacy? Even though this was their slide. Um, so I was like, okay, well, we'll take privacy out. So in my, my latest Cisco slides, privacy is not there. What that's being referred to is now all your DNS, your outbound DNS that goes beyond your enterprise, no matter where you are, is going to be encrypted, right? So it is using DNS crypt, and it is providing that privacy over your DNS traffic. And we'll get to that in a second. So one of the first things, how many of you have supervised devices in your environment? See, this is awesome. I love coming to Jamf, man. You go to Cisco and they're like, no one uses supervised devices. This is bad. Blah, blah, blah. Like, yeah. So when we talk to actual customers, they amazingly enough all have supervised devices, uh, most of them, right? So this is for a supervised device only. This is not for BYOD, right? So this is not, you know, me who at 2 a.m. is going to be ordering my, uh, my new iPhone X tonight, right? But... Um, you know, it's not for that where I'm paying for it myself, bringing it to work and rolling it with the MDM, right? It is for the devices that the corporation is buying and issuing to the, the end user. We all hate Cisco IT because when you buy a Mac now at Cisco, it's a lease and it's using DEP, right? And then as, as soon as you try and wipe out the OS and start over clean so you can get rid of what we call Cisco IT malware, um, you know, it, it it puts you right back into the MDM and all of their controls pop back on and their stupid firewall rules show up and, and, and yay. So, but that is, that's, you know, so we're seeing this more and more and more, but that's the type of device we're talking about. Ones that have been purchased or leased by the organization and issued to the student, the, uh, the faculty, the, the end user who's gonna use it, right? So the idea behind this is one app, but there's two separate services that it's enabling, two functions. So the first function, how many of you have heard of Cisco's umbrella or OpenDNS? You know, yeah, okay. So Cisco acquired OpenDNS. OpenDNS has been rebranded Umbrella, right? And, and this is Cisco Umbrella. So this is the OpenDNS protections. So using DNS crypt right from the iOS, right, out to the umbrella DNS server, so it's encrypted, getting that reputation around the DNS results and using DNS to say, don't go there, it's a bad network, right, or you know, it's a bad destination, so the ad bar that's been uh, infected or whatever doesn't show up when you're looking at your news, right, because that resolution was denied, right, or sent to a block page, right, but what it also does is provides you that content filtering, so no global proxy settings, right, no always on VPNs or on demand VPNs. Like I said, no reaching around the back of your head to scratch your nose. Straight out of the DNS layer, we can send you to a proxy or not. It's what we call intelligent proxy with umbrella. So based on the, the reputation of the d DNS destination that you're trying to get to, we can respond with our intelligent proxy address instead of their address. And then what happens is, is you come through at the DNS layer. So when you look at the profiles that are pushed down to a device that's controlled this way, right, you will see DNS proxy. You're not gonna see web content filter. The web content filter that you do see is what Apple called, what we're calling clarity. Uh, and this was the name that Apple approved instead of advanced malware, by the way. Clarity is the visibility aspect of all of this. Every single network call, every URL, every socket that every app, whether it's containerized or not, whether it's in a VPN or not, whether it's privatized or not, everything that sits in the application layer of an iOS stack, as it tries to get into the network portion of that stack, we gain visibility into the URLs, right? The URLs, the IP sockets, and so forth. That's where Apple put this hook 
right? So Tor, I see everything you're doing, right? I see it all. It's fantastic, right? I, mean, I do this in demos. All right, we loaded up this other app. Check this app out. It's, a, it's an interesting app. It's called Hi by Music, and it's designed to allow people to um, put whatever music they want to and play it on an iPad or an iPhone, right? I think it's not iPad only, actually. So you load this app up, and it turns the device into a web server. You can connect to your iPad now from anywhere on the local LAN, right, and start uploading files to it. It's really kind of fun. Uh, so I put one up there. It's like super secret ultimate business plan. And then I started to see, what is this device doing? What is this app doing? And in the visibility and clarity, I'm watching it call home to China every two minutes. Right? So my super secret business plan was sent over to Shenzhou, China, right? and, or Hengzhou, I can't say it, but it's China, right? which I thought was kind of funny. Right? So it, it's, it's providing this visibility that we never had before. Another customer was talking recently about how if, if there are bad apps in the app store, and it does happen from time to time, and then Apple revokes its cert, the app is now, for all intents and purposes, dead. But do you have an audit trail of how many users had that app that went somewhere? And where did that go? And this provides that level of visibility. In the next phase, not waiting on Apple, waiting on Cisco, there will be even more controls in there because we're tying our Talos intelligence into this. So Talos can start to provide reputations on the destinations and the URLs and so forth that you're going to from that level instead of the DNS proxy level. It's really neat. i got to move on a little bit here. But just to see what it looks like on, on, this is actually in the advanced malware protection or the AMP console. Now we're calling it Clarity because that's what Apple will agree to, but it's still in the AMP console, right? So in that console, we get ideas about what app it was. We, we get what's called app trajectory. When did this app talk on the network or you know, into the network stack and what was it talking to and how often? And you get like a time slider and you can start to see that. And at the bottom, you start to get a, a sortable list of every domain and every IP address it's ever talked to, right? So that's all down there, right? We also get device, uh, what we call device trajectory. So with that device, what other apps has it been using on the network and where have those apps been communicating to? And that's all listed there. We also are bringing that visibility to the security operator. This will not interest you all because you have Jam, right? But for the security operator, and I can tell you at Cisco, our security guys do not have access to Jam. They need a different level of visibility into what apps exist so that when there is some type of event or an alert of any kind, they have situational awareness of, is that app even in my environment or isn't it, right? Without being able to access the Jamf console because that's owned by his team, right? So you can search. It's fully Elasticsearch enabled. So you can start to say, I don't know what I'm looking for yet, but I know it, the app might look like this. And you can start to see if it's there and pull right in. So this is, this is all brand new. It, the user experience is completely unchanged to the end user on the iOS device. The, you know, what they might see is a difference. What they might get as a change is when they re re reach a blocked destination or try to go to a blocked destination, they will be redirected to an umbrella, you've been denied because this is bad, you're not allowed to surf porn at work, whatever the page is supposed to say, right? That's the type of change you'll see. Other than that, there will be no user experience change. No crazy pack file configurations or trying to force global proxy. No VPNing. Right? All of this is native experience from iOS. It is beautiful. It is so clean. So fresh and so clean. All right. So um, that is it. I am I'm literally got like 30 seconds left. So our timing worked out pretty good. Um, if there are any questions, I've been told I have to exit the room quickly so that they can set up for the next one. So I'm going to start walking towards the back. Matt's the, the real hero up here. So if you've got more questions about him and the API work and so forth, we'll be here. So I think we, we have time for one question if you guys have any questions. All right, round of applause. Thank cool. you.